Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, global population, some fish rate. Ah, oh, here we go. Mali, global population. Global population, Mali. Yeah, see. Right, I think it's time to finish the hat, my love. A long last. Here we go. Right, if you'd seen my last part of this video, you'll notice that I uh, ended it on a bit of a cliffhanger, I suppose. In a way, it was a bit cryptic. And this was largely down to the fact that, for the first time ever, with these new wireless headphones that I had, I started getting audio glitches whenever I tried to. Um, To basically record certain sections of it so I had to cut the video rather, like, rather short that last video now the bits that I had to cut out were on Christianity particularly the book of Revelation and biblical prophecy and end time prophecy Now, those of you who have watched my channel for a long while will know my stance on Christianity. On the fact that it's um, essentially a Roman construct. The biblical Jesus, Jesus in the Bible, didn't exist. It's a fictional character created by um, the, uh, the Emperor Flavius. Before he became Flavio, before he became uh, took over from his dad Trajan, and his um, long time sort of kind of brother in arms in a way, Josephus, who was um, his Jewish slave from birth, they both grew up together. Interestingly enough, Josephus was the only freed slave, not only the only freed slave, but also the only Jew to ever be seen as equal to the emperor. Um, when they were alive simply because of what they did in Jerusalem how they subjugated the Jewish people with basically using their religion against them but there is there is elements of what many people consider the biblical Jesus to be but it's in fact not there was probably a guy teaching the same sort of stuff kind of there's like little sort of elements of it that trickle through a bit like with the Old Testament where there's one line in the whole of the Old Testament that describes our actual creator and that's it and like I said last time and God said let there be light and there was and it was good he gave us a warning and then fucked off Well, with Jesus, kind of the same. The kingdom of God is inside us all, which is what he says, the temple of God is within us all. Only you can have a relationship with your, with your creator. No one else can. No one can tell you how to do that. There is no need for Pharisees or priest classes or priests in general. There's no need for the Vatican. No need for Rome. These elements, obviously, are... Our sort of creator slipping something in, yeah, under the radar. The person who taught this was very likely John the Baptist, who was seen by almost all the uh, the, pre the priest class in Jerusalem at the time as a sort of radical, dangerous. That's because he was radical, and dangerous. Um, it was a a thorn in the um, in the Jewish Pharisees' side. It was a thorn in the uh, the Roman Empire side. It was generally a nuisance, rather than the people getting them to kick off all the time. You know, 
stuff that revolutionaries do. You see, contrary to popular belief, Judaism is quite militant, quite paramilitary. Or it was. And this was largely, again, down to the interpretations of the uh, the priest class, mostly because they were the most educated people, because they were rich. Yeah? It's just the way it was. Most most Jews in Jerusalem couldn't read or write. So the Pharisees just told them what they wanted. And it's this that Josephus used to his advantage. Being a Jew, he could sort of mingle around with people, learn loads of stuff, report back to Flavius, and then they would cook up a, um, a narrative that sort of benefited them. Anyway, little did they know it was going to take off like it did. That's beside the point. The Book of Revelation, however, was written by John of Patmos. Now, most historical scholars will attest vehemently and constantly that what Revelation is referring to is the fall of the Roman Empire. And in some ways, I can kind of see why that would be the case, but Revelation was one of those things, or is one of those things, that you can apply to any time in history. And some of it would fit. But all of it will fit one certain timeline, and one certain chain of events, which is what we're living under now, I believe. Now, I'll get this out of the way, I'm not a Christian, you should know that by now. I'm not really any sort of religious affiliation. I believe in uh, a creator. I believe this world is ruled by the devil, in a way. The devil being, like I said last time, seven different beings. I basically have my own relationship with my creator, how I see fit. And I don't adhere to any religious sort of doctrine, and for good reason. Because that, all of them are designed to stray you away. But onto the book of Revelation. Christians around the world are, especially apocalyptic Christians, they are sort of giddy at the moment, really giddy. Because of the signs that they see. The thing is, though, that they don't really understand what Revelation is saying. Rather than telling you about a, a time of sort of happiness and bliss and good will prevail and blah, 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 blah. And you should be excited. Oh, no, anything but. Revelation is a warning. It's telling you something's coming that is deeply evil, dressed as something saintly. But it's not our man. What people interpret as the Messiah coming down from heaven in fire and brimstone, smiting the young, unworthy young just, ruling with a rod of iron, isn't something good. It's foretelling a tyrant that will rule for a thousand years. He will essentially force us into this bondage, never-ending bondage. Some of us, not all of us. But he will, he will spirit the worthy, as they call them, away from this world to another one, ruled by them. Remember what I said, any truly beneficial utopia is ruled by dominant dominion and control, and is therefore evil. If you've no free will, you're not free choice, you're not free. You're in bondage, you're in servitude. And that's what Revelation is promising you. 
Jolly Patmos was terrified because he saw a different side to his saviour, to his creator, or what he thought was his creator, what he thought was his saviour, and it was anything but. So yes, revelation is a warning and not something we should revere or be excited about. We should be looking for warning signs. And like the book of Revelation says, there will be signs in the heavens and in the earth. What does that mean? Well, people go on about earthquakes and floods and, you know, volcanoes going off and wars and everything else. But yeah, fine, yeah. You do look for them. But some of them were literal signs. Revelation 12 is a prime example. I've gone through it before. I saw a woman uh, clothed in the sun with a crown of 12 stars and a moon at her feet and she was in the uh, midst of childbirth, childbirth, giving birth to a king. Now, I've already gone over what that, what that actually was. And it was a, uh, an event that happened on September, September 23rd, 2017. Astronomical alignment. Well, there's a lot more little tidbits here and there that are in the book of Revelation that tell you what to spot. And tell you what to spot so then you can prepare, obviously. But there's other signs. Now, everyone's heard of Paradolia. <clears throat> I think everyone's heard of Paradolia anyway. If you don't know what pareidolia is, it's basically a natural process that the brain, that your human brain does. Because we're, we're sort of abstract thinkers, created, we tend to form recognisable sort of images out of, say, a, a rug. Yeah, the way the rug, a rug is sort of. Uh, it's been pushed, you know, out of the actual threading that's been pushed around and everywhere, or in a tree, or in a cloud. cloud in fact, cloud gazing is probably a prime example of, par of pareidolia. But it's used as an excuse a lot. And sometimes it's misused to explain away certain things that we would rather not admit to actually seeing. What do I mean? Well, say this picture for example, yeah, I put this at the, uh, at the end of my last vid because I wanted to see what people's reaction were and f to my surprise it didn't seem like anyone noticed, <clears throat> so I put it on something else. Now this is something that's been tried to be covered up by um, academics, sceptics, those that would rather explain everything away than actually face the fucking truth. That is an alien face, I don't care what you say. That is also, it looks exactly the same no matter what time of year it is, what the lighting conditions are, it looks like that all the time. It's just a trick of Google, mm, is it? Or is it? Or is that an actual carved fucking face of an alien grey in the middle of Antarctica? I think it's a carved face of an alien grey in the middle of Antarctica. What about this? That is um, not Krakatoa, it's one of the Filipino ones. I've forgotten its name. What do I remind you of? Hmm? What about this one? Now that looks like a lion, the side profile of a lion. Is it? I don't know. You see, there's been a lot of instances where photos like this have shown the true side to things.
And this is, a, I think this is largely down to the spirit of Araman. And I think this is being ushered in by using facilities like CERN, um, the experimentation into the dark cult magic that the Collins elite were doing, which I'll do a separate series, well, a separate sort of two-part video on Collins elite. They're a very interesting bunch. But what's this, what's this got to do with Hatman and ufology? Well, like I said, it's all the same. There's no difference between the two. Ufology is demonology. Demonology is ufology. There's no discernment between them. Like there's no discernment between anything that you start to research in our sort of neck of the woods. 9-11. If you want a prime example of dark magic in action, look at 9-11. When the Twin Towers fell, the amount of things that people were pulling out of the smoke, yeah, seeing some of them for the first time was mind-blowing. Now, I never sort of I never really gave that kind of research any sort of credibility for a long while until I started watching the 9-11 videos a bit a few years later on after talking to Jordan Maxwell actually 2003 and then I started paying a bit more attention to that Notre Dame is another one. If you watch the smoke coming from that fire in Notre Dame, you can see literal babies' faces and all sorts of demonic babies' faces coming out of the smoke. Sometimes pareidolia is a little bit too on the nose, if you get what I mean. Sometimes it's not pareidolia. It looks like what it is because it is what it is. Certain events, certain actions, certain sacrifices that are done, drawing these things. Like I said before, demonic magic is a living organism that lives outside our sort of reality and inside our reality at the same time. It's what they utilise to open the gates it's what brings elementals, elemental spirits. They're not spirits. Elementals, they're... To demonic magic, they are a manifestation of this element. It is actually, in a way, an elemental force. It's just that we can't perceive it. We can f Well, we can, in a way. We can feel it. Like I said last time, Dark matter, dark energy, zero point energy, it's all the same thing. It just reacts. And it's triggered into that reaction differently. By just coming into contact with our energetic field. When they first started doing the particle accelerator experiments, they were finding out that they were getting residue, a kind of residue left over that they could sort of detect in the inside the, the accelerators, obviously. And it seemed to be seeping through and they knew they had to find some way of co uh, containing it and the only way they could do that was with a Faraday cage. Um, because of the electromagnetic field, it just keeps it contained. And that was dark matter, the first time they found dark matter. There was only, well, there was only one, one facility that was able to contain it, and that was at first, and that was Detroit. Um, oh no, it wasn't. Sorry, it was, it was no. Yeah, it was. It was Detroit. Um, a university in Detroit, it may have been, it may be Detroit University, but what they discovered that was that a few days after 
leaving this dark matter in this containment field on the university campus. People's moods began to change, paranormal activity increased. And this didn't stay contained to the university campus after two or three months of this stuff being in that university, the actual sort of effects of it were spreading all over the city. This is why Detroit is like it is now. Because it's been spiritually and energetically destroyed, drained. It turns humans into nasty things. It really does. It opens our sort of our actual demonic side. All human, all, all matter is made from the ashes of dead demons, according to the Gnostics. Believe it or not. The Demiurge, who is the devil, or Yahweh, when he created the universe, he destroyed all the first creations that he made, that he made all the first you could, I suppose you could call them demons, but they weren't. And this was because his mother, Sophia, contacted him for the first and last time before shattering into pieces. And it's the pieces of her divine essence that makes our souls. And the stars. Light, in general, is... sort of a divine essence manipulated and created by the demiurge this is why I said that no matter what we worship on this planet if it's a demon to another religion if no matter how benevolent or light light side the religion may seem it's anything but devil plays his both hands. There are now four facilities I think in, in the US that house dark matter and are able to house dark matter and that's Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia and Portland. <laughs> now, oh New York, sorry, five. Now, can anyone tell me what the similarity between all of those different locations in the US is? are all deprived, all very violent, all descending into chaos. But that's just the time, that's just society in general. Is it? oh. It's being instigated and moved by something. Hmm? These five places in the US aren't the only ones though, however, yeah, in the entire world. There are more. One of them in Johannesburg, in South Africa, London in the UK, Edinburgh in the UK, Manchester in the UK. There are eight in Ukraine because they pretty much house the crap for everybody. But it's all Western nations. You'll notice how China sort of, well, had the Rather the same plan of keeping it away from the cities, away from the nation. Same with Russia. They had the good sense to do that. We saw a money-making opportunity in down the consequences. But you can see this harmonic force everywhere. Ironman is a... I said he was of our own making the Antichrist of our own making, and that's what he is. But he will take us into a digital hell. A false, artificial, digital hell. Dressed as a wonderful utopia. even as you're plugged into that matrix and begin your journey in there you suddenly realize that it's not as good as you thought it would be it's not like the real world 
but you made that choice you chose to be part of that and at that point it's too late no turning back and this is how Ariman will control all the people that agree to go in there have dominion over those souls I suppose you could consider the ultimate manifestation of Ariman or Hartman will be AI like I said at the beginning of all this and in my series on the system emphatically quite a few times this has all happened before and so in the days of Noah so also be in the days of the coming of the son of man be Matthew New Testament another one of those times where our creator actually sneaks something through what does it mean as in the days of Noah it means exactly that our ancient history was far more technical, technologically advanced and far more bizarre than we are told or led to believe control a person's history and you control their present and when you control their present you control their future we are being led down the garden path We're skipping and singing with glee mm. readily accepting it and drawing it in craving it anything but this world and because they're making it shitty as they can that we will absolutely beg to go into the virtual version of it that'll be worse far worse I'm going to end this series with something that I've played before a few times but I want you to listen very carefully to what is said it's from a 2011 um, Nexus conference the guy who's speaking is the editor of Nexus magazine who has a very strange conversation with um, one of the a former RAND CEO who became part of the RAND Rubicon Revealers which is basically a team of ex RAND employees that are allowed to divulge information whatever they want to one person and one person only and that's it and they can the person they give it to can spread it however they want but no one's allowed to use the name and no one can know who they are and they can't tell anyone else how put off was another one that was like that he was probably the only one that got away well kind of got away with it he died shortly after but anyway it's beside the point listen very closely to what he says because we're being set up for this now anyway like share subscribe I hope you enjoyed this series. I'll see you later. It, it does its thing at a certain time in the future and it terrifies these intelligence agents. they absolutely terrified of what it might do. A lot of speculation as to what, why and how. These guys did not have a very happy view of it. They encouraged us to circulate information which did not make China look good. I refused, I didn't want to take sides, I didn't know at that point whether I could fully trust these guys, weren't just playing me. It wasn't until I got to know Acolyte personally that I started to shift towards, no, these guys actually mean what they're saying and I saw more evidence, which I can't go into details about, to convince me of it. So in an, what they're saying is that in, one day in the future, in the very near future, if this scenario is true, people with a certain gene sequence if you like or a certain enzyme structure in the z gene sequence whatever that means will experience some sort of shift differently from the rest of us I don't know whether that shift is death because in some of these cases 
when you can when you're talking to people who deal with aliens, a lot of aliens don't believe in death. They see the physical body die, but to a lot of aliens, a physical body is no more than a deep sea diving suit to a human. It's something you put your body into where in a hostile environment it doesn't kill you and you get out at the end. Do any of you feel that you're just a physical body and that when you die in the physical that you die and you never exist again? Each one of you knows deep down you're an immortal spiritual being which means you get out of this deep sea diving suit you might want to get and put on another one and be born as a baby again. Incidentally that movie Avatar one of, the, one of the most interesting things I hope you took from the movie Avatar is the technology does exist to take the consciousness out of one human and put it into another vehicle. It doesn't have to be a, a, a human body. You can put it into another vehicle and that consciousness can function and operate machinery follow instructions. It's been used on a military level for a long time. In fact, in some ways it's the basis of how a lot of the extraterrestrial craft actually travel. It, come, it, it leads to the idea that some of the craft are alive. And if by having, if alive means having consciousness, then yes, those craft are alive. And more than one whistleblower in the public domain, David Adair, look him up on the internet, a rocket prodigy from America. It's 18, he was, I think it was under, it was under 21 because he wasn't able to sign any security agreements. They took him to a strange craft down in, Area 51 or Hangar 18 and the first thing he said to the German scientist overseeing the project was, oh my God, that engine's alive. And uh, that's when they knew that you know, this technology is much greater. Okay, so have you all read this? I mean, I don't know what to make of it, but that's what they believed and that's what they had synthesised and assessed and I've got to tell you, those intelligence agents, unless they were all putting on a huge show, yeah, they, they seriously, they took this very serious. Now somewhere in there, I'm hoping that was the mention about the Chinese. After the briefcases were opened and discussion ensued, it became clear that the Chinese expected everything to remain the same until at least October or around October 2016. So I've been watching this time frame from since 2010. I'm curious to see what other people on the internet nominate as the next big date. I mean, we've had 12-12-2012 and other dates come and go, 11-11. I've lost track. Many times I've trampled to the top of a hill and meditated and fulminated and levitated and hoped that my output changed the consciousness of humanity. Who knows? But um, they, the Chinese government in their briefcases seem to indicate, from my understanding, that we have until 2016, maybe October 2016. And guess what happens in October 2016? US presidential election. And guess what people are asking more and more? Is Trump going to win? Is Hillary going to win? The implications of either are quite profound.